recognize that this can be intimidating. We know that this can be confusing. We understand that when a decision is made to visit a church, one of the more challenging things is to know where to go and what to do when you arrive. What we want to do is to offer you another perspective. At First Baptist Church, we're committed to offering premier facilities along with programming designed to bring about spiritual formation in your life. Whether you're a student, young adult, senior adult, median adult, children, no children, whatever your life stage might be, you'll find there's a place for you here at First Baptist Church. Good morning. We are so glad that you have joined us today. In case you were not aware, we are three days away from Christmas. Now, don't everybody rush out and go shopping yet. Let's, let's wait a few. But just wanted to remind you, and we're two days, therefore, ahead of Christmas Eve, and we're going to have a wonderful, rich worship time here that evening. Love for you to be here. Bring your friends and neighbors and colleagues. It's a great time of year where people most often will say, you bet you I'd love to come if you'll just issue an invitation. We meet here at 6 o'clock, and we'll have a night of carols, candlelight, and communion. Love for you to be here and with your friends and family. If you are a guest with us, we want to give you a special welcome today and say thank you for joining us. There's a card in the pew in front of you. If you would take just a moment and fill that out and give us as much information as you're willing to entrust to us. We promise we won't abuse it or sell it. We just want to use it to get to know you and know how we can minister to you as we hopefully will see you join us to become a part of this mission that God has us on together. Also, there's a lot of activities uh, in your worship guide. Please take note of those. Note that offices will be closed a couple of days because we're going to let folks sort of be with their families, which would be a great thing. And notice that you're in giving. Um, if you'll get stuff into us by postmarked by December 31st or drop it off to the church before the end of day that day, you can get credit for that as well. We'd love for you to participate in that and in enjoy the fruits of your labor as God continues to bless those of you that are worshiping with us online or um, via the television, we welcome you. Thank you for tuning in and joining us on this, the fourth Sunday of Advent. Now, if you would stand and say hello to some people you're worshiping next to. Jesus. 
fourth Sunday of Advent, as we've already mentioned, and today we light the fourth candle, the candle of love, as we're moving one step closer to Christmas Eve. This love is most visible and tangible in the person of Jesus. His coming, his living, his dying, his rising from the dead and living again in the hope of his imminent return. In Mary's day, the most important man in the world was Caesar Augustus. He'd been adopted by Julius Caesar, and after he died, Julius Caesar was declared to be divine, so they called Caesar Augustus the son of God. When Augustus seized power, he ended the civil wars. You might remember Antony and Cleopatra, so he brought peace, the Pax Romana, we call it. Because of this, he was called the people's savior. The inauguration of Augustus as emperor was declared throughout the empire as good news, the same word we get from gospel, the good news, gospel. Notice that Rome used then four expressions to describe Augustus. Savior, son of God, bringer of peace, announcement of his reign as the gospel or good news. Isaiah, about 700 years before Augustus was ever born, described Jesus this way. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his rule and reign, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. In summary, Isaiah tells us this. Jesus is Savior, not Augustus or anyone or anything else. Jesus is Son of God. Again, He's the only one. Jesus is not just the bringer of peace. He's the Prince of Peace. And good news? You bet. Jesus Christ is the good news incarnate. Salvation is in Him alone. Today we also highlight the final Chrismon behind me. You see a circle with a cross in the middle of it. The circle signifies the eternal life that we experience in Christ. And, of course, the cross reminds us that it was through the cross that we experienced God's greatest, most vivid act of love, that of his cruel death, that we now experience life in him, life with him forever and always. So let's celebrate his love today. Let's sing of his love. And remember that when all else fades, fades away, there is one thing that will always remain. Jesus Christ and his love. Will you stand with us as we worship, as we sing? Let's all sing this together. Higher than the mountains that I 
yourself in human form, became one of us, God with us, Emmanuel. And may that truth more and more, as moments go by, God, may that revolutionize our lives, that you, the great God, would love us so much that you would stoop so low to reach out and love us as one of your very own. Glory to God in the highest, oh God. Thank you for that great love that sustains and buoys us up and lasts us forever. It's in your holy and precious and loving name we pray, Jesus.
Thank you, Ken. The choir, because God is a mountain mover is best evident. It's been um, encouraging us to do and to be. On Friday, we went down to St. Benedict's Chapel where we helped feed the homeless. We served probably about 73 people. One thing that really impressed me was on the wall down there, there's this sign that says, you're serving royalty. That made us stop and think, that's exactly what we were doing. I think we went down there thinking, you know, we're gonna serve these people and, and we're gonna bless these people. And we all left feeling like we were the ones that had been blessed. Well, it's, it's a moving commercial spot. It's moving, it's sentimental, it's an idealized holiday depiction. Unfortunately, it has absolutely nothing to do with Christmas. I don't want to be Scrooge, but that had absolutely nothing to do with Christmas and what uh, Christmas is about. It does exactly what Apple and its advertisers want to promote. It, it sells you what it wants you to buy. The idea being that if, you will be, that if you will buy an iPhone, you can have a Christmas that looks like that. It's sentimental, it's moving, it's an idealized holiday depiction. A more accurate depiction of a time of year such as this is that families are under financial strain trying to live up to something like this that our culture has imposed upon us, feeling this burden to, to have to buy gifts, wondering if, if we can buy, buy gifts. The marriage may not have been as perfect as that one appeared, driving a, an SUV on, on pristine white roads where, where you're, you're the only one on the road. Did you notice that there's no traffic? They had the road to themselves. They had the park to themselves. It's a beautiful, idealized picture. Maybe the greater reality is, is that mom and dad, if they're even still together, maybe they're talking about just holding out until after the holidays and getting a divorce. That they've endured all that they can endure, but we don't want the kids to endure this, have to face this during the holidays, so we'll, we'll wait until after Christmas. A greater reality might be that one of the children, and by the way, is a perfect family, American ideal there, one, one, one boy, one girl, mom and dad, Greater reality might be that, that one of the kids didn't go at all because he has or she has a, an addiction, some problem, is a rebellious child, is the prodigal child. That's, that's a greater reality statistically. And instead of being able to arrive at grandma and grandpa's house and, and running and jumping into their arms, a greater reality may be that you had to stop at the Alzheimer's unit to see one of them. Or maybe you had to stop at the hospital to see one of them. You know, we as, as Christians, Western Christians, we, we don't do well with, with Christianity and faith that is hard and difficult and, and, and difficult. We, we don't do well with the difficulties of life. We've been sold a bill of goods in this country that if you're going to be a Christian, you have to be a celebratory kind of, of Christian. Every day is, is a great day. Every day is a, is a victorious day. Every day is a, is a day that has been championed by God. It's depicted in our, in our corporate worship. We, we always have to be happy. We always have to be glad. We, we always have to come to church with, with a smile on our face, pretending that, that everything is great, that our life looks something like this. When in reality, it probably doesn't. In fact, when you see a commercial spot like that, it's, it's probably a great deal of guilt, a great deal of remorse. Maybe a sense of failure that your, your family doesn't look like that. You don't have that idealized portrait. Few of us, if any at all, really do. We don't do well with the hard realities of life. When the greater reality is, is, that, is that the great saints of God are, are formed and fashioned in the crucible of God. 
we are fashioned when, when we are crushed and, and, we were bro- and we are broken. You see, there's not a single purchase in the world, not, a, not an Apple iPhone, not, not, there's not a purchase in the world that will take away the hurt and the pain and the misery of the hard realities of life. That's why I want to talk to you this morning about my favorite Christmas store. My favorite Christmas store is described in in the book of Psalms in chapter 80. I invite you to open your your Bible, your iPad, your smartphone, whatever it is you have to follow the Word of God. I I invite you to turn to to Psalm 80. Because here it's where we find this, this, this Christmas store, my favorite Christmas store, that helps us to look redemptively at life. That as we face the hard realities of life, the cruelties of life, the brokenness of life, life that so often comes against us and crushes us, it's here where where you can find hope and possibilities. My favorite Christmas store is God's Restore. It's the plea of the psalmist. It is a communal plea of the people of God, their voices together, crying out this common refrain that is found throughout Psalm 80 when the psalmist says, Oh God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved, verse 3. And then verse 7 again, Oh God of hosts, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. A final occurrence in verse 19, O oh Lord of God, God of hosts, restore us, cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. My favorite Christmas store is God's restore. It's what God has done and what God is doing to come into lives that that are broken, lives that that are messed up, Lives that that are wanting, lives that are grieving, lives that are broken. My favorite store is the store of restore. Because you see, as this psalmist begins to write, as he begins his his plea, we find that, that God's restore is a place to be heard. That we're not a people who live in isolation. We're not a people who are just out there on our own fending for ourselves regardless of how much we try to, to offer that appearance. You see, we try, we try to masquerade ourselves, don't we? We, we? we masquerade ourselves in sanctuaries. We masquerade ourselves behind stained glass. We masquerade our faith uh, behind suits and smiles and pleasant exchanges on Sunday morning. But when there's a spirit of brokenness, when our lives have been crushed, we can be sure that it's, it's God's restore where we are heard. You see, the psalmist begins his appeal in verse 1. Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. Oh God, restore us and cause your face to shine upon us and we will be saved. Both ancient and modern Jews would refer to this plea and this, this, this sense of what the people are feeling. They, they would refer to, refer to it as the Hester Panim. And it's the hiding of God's face or the eclipse of God. There is this sense that the community of faith has. They have this sense that that God is no longer with them, that God is not present with them. And there is this desperate plea as they have been ravaged by nations around them, as they have been taken into exile, as they are a people who are broken and crushed. There is this, this overwhelming sense that God does not hear their prayers. That God is absent, that God is no longer present among them. I wonder this morning, how many of you have ever felt that way? 
How many of you have ever been so broken in life, so dispirited, so despairing that when you pray and you cry out to God, you feel as if your prayers are getting, getting no higher than, than the ceiling. You feel it as if God is distant, as if God doesn't care. And if God cared, why doesn't God do something? The psalmist even goes as far as to remind God who he is, what his obligations are. I love the description that the psalmist uses here. Oh, give ear, shepherd of Israel. Turn your ear to us. This is your role. This is your function as a shepherd cares for the sheep. You're supposed to be caring for us. In the pleading, in the urgency, in the desperation that oozes out of these lines in this psalm carries the idea that if God would just hear me, then surely God would do something. There is this desire for God to turn and to look, that God will see my plight, and because God is my shepherd, then surely God will do something. But there's something else. We come to to God's restore and we find that that God is a God who hears even though we we don't see God acting in ways that we think he ought to act. We are assured that God hears because he is our, our shepherd. But something else I so appreciate about God's restore where we go as the people of God, we find that God's restore, God's restore is a place to exercise our faith. Now keep that in mind, God's Restore is a place where we exercise our faith. And as I begin to read verses 4 through 7, you're going to be hard-pressed to figure out where faith is being really exercised. Because what you're going to hear in verses 4 through 7 and in verses I'm going to leave out, verses 8 through 16, which you can lead for yourself, it's really just complaining lamenting that's what two-thirds of the Psalter really is the entire Psalter are what we would call laments grieving about the the inequalities of life that life's not fair God why are you allowing this to happen we're we're your people we've committed ourselves to you if you're God and you're the shepherd the good shepherd why are you not acting for our greater good but it will Consider in just a moment how this is a great exercise of faith. Listen to verses 4 through 7. O Lord God of hosts, how long? And that's the main question of this psalm, and we find it throughout the Psalter. How long will you be angry with the prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears, and, and you have made them to drink tears in large measure. You, you make us an object of contention to our neighbors, and our, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Oh, Lord God of, of hosts, restore us and, and cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. How long? How long will you be angry? How long will you, will you refuse to hear our prayers? At least from their perspective, that's how they're viewing things. How long? The psalmist even appeals to the reputation of, of God. Our, our neighbors have, have made us into objects of contention. God, if you're not going to act for me, at least act for your reputation. Because when we offer the appearance of being a weak people, that means you're a weak God. How long? Your reputation is at stake for being the good shepherd. How long? The verses we're not going to read, but you can read them for yourself, verses 8 through 16. He gives this wonderful metaphor of how how they have been ravaged by, by animals. It's kind of a, we've come to a place of, of being a scorched earth. We have just been taken down to nothing. How long is this going to, to go on? Your honor and your integrity is at stake. Your neighbors are talking about you. But I, I consider these complaints, these laments. 
I consider this to be one of the great expressions of faith in Scripture. You see, unfortunately, probably in in your faith journey, in your understanding of the Christian faith, you have probably been wrongly taught that that whenever you have, have complaints against God, that if you're really going to be a good Christian, if you're really going to, if you're really going to reflect faith in, in your life, if you're going to play the masquerade, if you're going to put on the right face that you're supposed to wear in the life of faith, you've probably been taught that you have to suppress your complaints. You have doubts, you have fears, you have complaints, you have questions. When you don't think God is living up to his end of the bargain, we, we've kind of picked up, if not by teaching, if by inference, that, that if I'm really going to be a good Christian, I have to suppress those things. I can't talk about them. I'm not free to express them. When I consider these complaints by the psalmist, the community of faith, I consider these to be great expressions of faith. Because their complaints grow out of their history with God. Their complaints grow out of their relationship with God. You see, these are people that have a past. They they have a past association with God, just as you and I do, even in in our seasons of hardship. They know that the living God is a God who speaks. The living God is a God who has acted in time. And because he's a God who speaks, because he is a God who acts, I can complain. You've spoken and you've acted before. Why don't you speak and act now? Makes perfect sense. Because I'm a person of faith. Because I've heard God speak. because Because I've seen God act. Because he has acted in my life and because I've seen him act in in the lives of others, I'm given the latitude to complain on the basis of our our previous relationship with one another. Now, to be sure, protest is an affirmation of our faith. Our protest against God is an affirmation of our belief that God is a God who speaks and God is a God who acts. I think the psalmist, his dark night of the soul that he's experiencing, I think it's a great teaching tool for us. I think you and I should see his dark night, his dark night of the soul, that we should see this as being instructive for our faith journey, that that we have light, we can complain. We have the right to complain as a people of faith. God's a big enough God to handle our our disappointments in him when God's not acting in the way that we have seen him act in the past in other situations. But there's something else I find comforting about shopping at God's Restore. Not only is it a place where where we can be heard, and not only is it a place where where we exercise our, our faith, but we also find here at God's Restore that that it's a place to find redemption. We see it here in the ending in verses 17 through 19. He says, let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Revive us and we will call upon your name. O Lord God of hosts, restore us, cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. He has pleaded and asked God for restoration. He has gone to God in in great transparency. He has expressed his complaint to God. He has asked of God that that his complaints would, would be heard. He has taken down the mask. He's no longer pretending that that everything is okay. And now then, he comes to the altar and the prayer shifts gears and he's now praying in terms of a messianic hope. What God is going to do in the future. Oh, you've you've heard it in these verses. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. 
He's talking about messianic hope. Hopeful expectations. And at this time of year, in this Advent season, in this, this Advent passage, when we think about, about the Advent, when we think about the coming of the Lord, when we, when we think about the incarnation, what is the incarnation? But God's response to people who are crying, to people who are pleading, to people who are begging, to people who are in misery and grief-stricken. The incarnation is God's response. God with us. It is God's response to a people who are crushed and oppressed. And so maybe, maybe what's missing for us is that sense of pleading and urgency the desperate crying for God to do something for God to bring revival for God to bring restoration to our souls for life to have meaning and in purpose in this quagmire of life that makes absolutely no sense maybe what we're we're lacking is that spirit of brokenness in repentance. In the, in the book, Blue Like Jazz, written several years ago, interesting little book, but in Blue Like Jazz, it tells the story of a few Christians at Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and there was this one festive event there at Reed College, a kind of a party event one weekend, and they, and these, this small group of Christians, they knew it was going to be a pretty wild event, and so they, they did something unique. They, they set up a confessional booth, and right there in the, in the midst of, of this party and all this uh, goings on, doing what students do for the most part, in, in the middle of that is this, is this tent, a confessional booth. But when the students came in, the ones who dared to venture in expecting one thing, they got something completely different. Because when they went into this confessional booth, thinking that it was going to be a place to go and, and to confess their sins, it was something completely different. Because when they went into this confessional booth that this group of Christians had constructed, when they, when they sat down, a Christian would come out and confess to them. The, conf the Christian would confess that, that, that we have failed to be loving. As believers on this campus, we, we have failed to be loving. We, we have been bitter and we have been judgmental. As Christians, we have been critical. And I ask your forgiveness. What a unique approach. Maybe what we're lacking is that repentant spirit. Maybe what we're lacking is that sense of brokenness, that, that sense of being despondent, being at a place of, of desperation where, where we are crying out to God to restore us. Because that's what he wants to do. That's what he has done. That's what he's doing. See, even the prophet would speak to it, prophet Joel. Just piggybacking on this, there's a wonderful passage in the prophet of Joel in chapter 2. In verse 25, where God says through his prophet, Then I will restore for you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. Then I will restore for you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. If you're familiar with it, locust infestation, especially in, in desert regions, Sahara regions of the world, it, in Middle Eastern countries, it, it brings absolute devastation. In some of these locust infestations, there would be 60 million locusts, 60 million, 60 million locusts. I don't even know, who took the time to count this? 60 million locusts in less than half a square mile. And some of these locust infestations were 460 square miles 
in size. It was absolute devastation. God says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to restore the years you've lost to these swarming locusts. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor that he's utilizing here to talk about the swarming nations that that have come and devastated the land, that have devastated them as a people and have dispersed them as, as, as a people in exile. And what God says I'm going to do and what I'm doing is is I'm going to restore the years that you've lost. Now that word restore in the Hebrew that he's utilizing, it it, it has various meanings and interpretations. In one sense, you may anticipate when he says I'm going to restore the years that you've lost, that he's going to go back and give you these years. And it has broad application to to our lives. There are seasons in your life and mine that were devastated by locust swarms. Where your life was parched, where your life was scorched. Where your life experienced a degree of suffering and hardship that you would have never anticipated It was so deep and so profound, you cannot even explain it to other people. In fact, when it's mentioned, you try to deflect the conversation. But what he's saying is, I'm going to restore this. I can't go back and give you those. I'm not going to go back and give you those years. And we need to hear that, church, that the kingdom of God is never backwards. That's where we have to be careful of sentiment, as it's shown in that commercial we saw at the very beginning. Sentimental, sentimentality, sentiment, when you see it, sentiment is, a, is an attempt to recover what was once known, what we once had, or trying to preserve what we have. And it really has no place in the life of faith because what God is doing is always in the future. What God is is seeking to accomplish is always forward, never backwards. Now, he'll have us refer back to memorial incidences in in the hopes that we'll see that because God has been faithful in the past, he'll be faithful in the future. Because you've seen people trust me back here, you can be sure you can trust me out here. But God's not in the process of trying to restore in the sense of recovering what once was. This is a God who is making all things new, and that's out here in the future. So he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that season of of your life where the locusts swarmed and brought devastation upon your life. What I'm going to restore for you in the future will be of such magnitude, will be of such greatness. It will be so far beyond what you could even comprehend now that what you went through back here would just pale in comparison. In fact, you'll be able to look back and you'll see how God used that in his sovereignty and his providential care to get you to this place of richness and reward out here. That's the kind of restoration that he's accomplishing. In fact, the Apostle Paul would say regarding our suffering now in this world, he doesn't diminish it. Our pain and suffering is very real. He doesn't diminish it. But Paul says what we're going through now, your your locust swarm season in your life, it is but temporary light affliction, momentary light affliction compared to the eternal weight of glory that's out here. When you balance this, your your difficult seasons in life, your seasons of devastation, when weighed against the eternal weight of glory, there's, there's no comparison. This restoration, it's, it's not a recovery of the past. In this language of restoration, it's where we find the gospel. That's what restoration is about. It is about the gospel. That's what the incarnation is about. What God is restoring is God is moving us forward into the future that he has in store for us. It is built around the good news of Jesus Christ. It's not about a recovery. It's about a resurrection. And the resurrection that we see in this restoration process 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of our hopes and our dreams and our aspirations, this resurrection gives us back our past as a gift from God. The resurrection gives us back our past as a gift from God. And the only place you can find it is in God's restore. Let's pray together. Our Father, how grateful we are that you are a God that has given us hope for a broken creation. And not just for a broken creation, but for broken lives. When our spirits are crushed and oppressed, we know, God, that that you have a resurrection in store for us. That you are a God who longs to restore. You are a God that longs to take those seasons in life and to use them in a way that brings restoration. In a way that brings revival and renewal to our spirits. And Father, we know that that this process of restoration that it's something that we find, it's something that we discover, something that we know at the altar of our own hearts. And so as we come to our time of invitation, Lord, I pray that as some are hurting and wounded this morning, that, Lord, they might find their restoration in you. That as some here this morning or by way of television or internet, as they are as they are searching for meaning and purpose in life. Father, I pray that this might be their day of being restored by you. A day when they no longer would cover up their emptiness by by the next purchase, the next drink, the next fix but that, Lord, they might be restored and they might find their deliverance in you. Let this be our prayer in this time of invitation, that lives might be saved, that lives might be renewed, and that we each one, Lord, would have that sense of urgency and pleading to be a restored people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For more information about First Baptist Church, give us a call or visit us online at firstlubbock.org. Download our mobile app to experience even more from FBC. Check out our other worship times, Sundays at 8.15, 9.30, and 11 a.m. Experience these online or come visit us at Broadway and Avenue V in Lubbock. Thanks for watching, God bless, and have a great week.